Okay. Yay. Hey, how's We it meet going? Again. <laughs> how's it going? Good, good. Busy times. Yes. So today we'll talk about Amazon withholding your funds. Yes. Um, so tell me about this uh, phenomena. How, how does it work? Why does Amazon does that? So as you know, um, a buyer doesn't pay the seller directly. It goes through Amazon. And Amazon holds your money in an account dedicated to you that you provide the information for to Amazon. And they open a window every 14 days for you to uh, take out the money. If Amazon decides that you did something that they consider bad. Really bad. Yeah. Not necessarily really bad. They suspend you or they investigate or it's enough that they have a suspicion. Because uh, with Amazon, of course, you're guilty before you're proven innocent. Right. Uh, so first thing they do is shut everything down, hold your money in case there are chargebacks, returns, uh, you need to compensate buyers or, or whatever uh, would happen with Amazon's uh, decision or action or investigation. Um, and then if your, your appeal and your appeals fail, then Amazon will hold your money for at least 90 days. And it's up to you to request release of the money through disbursement. And then Amazon would usually tell you that they will process this and investigate it in the, in, within 90 days and you'll get a reply. Can you give me examples of cases where this could happen? Can, can, you, can they do that for every type of suspension? Withholding your funds, yes. With her, withholding your funds permanently, no. So withholding your funds, it makes sense, even though it kind of contradicts their job as a trustee holding your funds in the account, which belong to the seller. They do not belong to Amazon. They even say so in their agreement. Um, because how otherwise are they going to, if they need to do chargebacks, if they need to do returns because of something that you did, how else are they going to get it? They're not going to start suing each and every seller. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a matter of reasonableness and proportions. Withholding permanently is, uh, I would say, an overreach uh, and a little bit, in my opinion, abuse of Amazon's power. Um, and we'll, we'll get to it. I'll, I'll explain all about it. So when do they refuse to release it? I understand that there are cases where it's easier and, and you appeal and there are cases where you really have to fight. When does that happen? So Amazon uses this through um, their agreement. Obviously, they have power through the agreement. We'll go through it in a, in a moment. It usually, when it comes to permanent withholding of funds, they, it's after Amazon decides two things. One, that your account was complicit or involved in some sort of deceitful, fraudulent, or illegal activity. And two, and this is something a lot of sellers don't know, you fail their IPI. What, what? is it, IPI? Glad you asked. <laughs> IPI is a personal uh, video verification interview, which, which basically the, the purpose of this interview is to fight money laundering scheme, financing terrorism and stuff like that. But they use it to kind of see your uh, veracity, your honesty, who you are, your identity. And if they don't like what they see and they decide that you failed, that's a prerequisite that you will not get your funds back and that will hold them uh, in perpetuity. There are some, by the way, some uh, sellers that were brave enough to sue Amazon through arbitration. And the arbitrator specifically said that uh, that's far reaching because it's, uh, it's not in any of the contracts. It's not in Amazon's policy that says that if you want your funds released, you have to successfully pass this interview. Uh, and it's not part of the agreement. It's not in that section of the agreement that says Amazon could hold your funds whenever they want, basically. You can fight it. But that's usually the two prerequisites. One, you did something that Amazon decided is decept deceitful. And two, you failed the IPI. Mm -hmm. Do you have cases where you felt that this was legitimate to hold the, fun the funds permanently? Or cases where you felt this is outrageous? I'll tell you what. Legally, from a, a contractual point of view, I don't think Amazon should ever have the authority to withhold your funds 
regardless or without proportion to what you have done or without even proving some sort of injury. They just declare that you did something wrong. They've investigated, uh, uh, you know, a thorough, a thorough investigation as they decide to, to conduct, and then they hold you money. So, why do they, so what's their authority today? How do they do it when, when they do withhold your funds? So the relationship between a seller and Amazon, you, of, you always have to remember that, is a contractual relationship. It's a business transaction. A business contract should not allow one side to punish the other. That's not the purpose of a business relationship. Uh, the uh, authority that Amazon drives the, the, the withholding of funds from is uh, section two to their agreement, where it says that if uh, you've done any uh, fraudulent or deceptful practices, they will withhold uh, your money permanently according to their discretion. Mm -hmm. But that's actually what's called in legal terms, liquidated damages clause. What is a liquidated damages? It's supposed to bring the offended party back as it, to a point where as if there is no uh, breach of the contract. It's not supposed to be a metaphorical uh, guillotine or uh, scare the other party into compliance. That's not the purpose. If you don't trust the other party, don't enter into an agreement to begin with. No one enters, no seller, here Amazon, listen to me, no seller enters into an agreement knowing that they intend to breach it. That's not why you go enter into an agreement. You want to have a business relationship with Amazon. Mm -hmm. There's also this issue where the liquid, liquidated damages, the, according to the law and according to, according to precedent, can't function as a punishment other than the, the, the supposed to make sense because it's a business relationship. Um, it's a power that's irrelevant to civil law, okay? Punishments are for the government, for authorities, for agencies, not for a private company like Amazon. But it's their own company. I mean, they, they should be able to decide who's on their platform, who's not, and, and what are the rules, aren't they? Listen, the powers between Amazon and a single, single seller are so... Um, disproportionate. Thank you. <laughs> disproportionate to begin with. It's what's called an, a contract of adhesion, meaning that the seller has an option Take it or leave it, okay? And then, we, and let's go into a little bit of legalese, okay? So how do you attack such an agreement, okay? The fact that one side is stronger than the other doesn't make it a wrong contract. There are a lot of contracts where one side says, here are the, here are the terms, take it or leave it. The question is to look into the actual terms of the contract and see if they're proportionate, if they're conscionable, okay? And then if we look at section two, where Amazon derives their power to withhold your funds, we need to look at two types of what's called unconscionable clauses, okay? There is what's called procedural unconscionability, meaning before you even enter the contract, is everything clear? Is everything out in the open, okay? So uh, examples where the court decided that a contract was not conscionable is an employment agreement where out of 18 pages, at the bottom, bottom of the 17th page, there was something that said that if uh, you did something wrong, uh, they can take all your funds, okay? Right. They're hiding it. And here, courts have decided, Supreme Court included, that Amazon is not hiding it. The seller has an option to review the agreement, see this uh, clause in that agreement, and decide if they want to enter and participate or not. But here's where I would argue. The agreement on its own is not enough. The agreement includes all the policies. And I don't think there's any possible way that a seller, before he even becomes a seller and knows what this platform is and all the responsibilities that include and all the obligations that are included to be compliant as a seller, would read that it. they have read all the policies and know exactly what they're entering into. That's why I think that even on the, the grounds of uh, procedural unconscionability, Amazon fails, the contract fails. But then we'll take another step forward. And we say, okay, when they enter the contract, everything was out in the open. The fact, again, that one side is stronger than the other doesn't matter, okay? It's the actual terms. 
But then if something, when it comes to uh, an action, for example, where Amazon decides to suspend you because you did something, and now they want to withhold your funds, let's review it again, and let's review the section that's uh, uh, in controversy and see if it shocks your conscience and your mind. If it shocks your conscience, it fails. And uh, there's a specific arbitrator that uh, I have to quote because um, it definitely shocked his conscience. <laughs> uh, and one of the things that uh, he shut down the uh, contract and, and said that it wasn't enforceable was that Amazon decides, remember we said liquidated damages are, uh, need to be foreseeable of the proportionate of the uh, injury. Mm -hmm. um, he says there is absolutely no way that each and every time Amazon happens to suspend a seller, the exact amount in their account is a foreseeable proportionate amount for the They covers would the always withhold everything that's in the account. If they decide that you did fraudulent activity and all the, the you know, the three ones, deceptive, fraudulent, and illegal, yes, they will hold mm -hmm. all your account, all your funds if you fail the IPI. Because Amazon cannot seriously argue that the amount of a third-party seller's funds to which it has access at any time at Amazon's choosing just happens in every case to be a reasonable forecast of the just compensation. And so what do you do? So let's say they do withhold your fund. You had an insert. The insert is asking for a, a review right after you, you ha you're giving away a free product. Um, and then Amazon suspends you and withholds your funds. What do you do? What's, what's the next step? The classic would be to file an arbitration. First, obviously, appeal and exhaust uh, the internal processes uh, within Amazon. And if that doesn't work, then you will have to file uh, a suit and, uh, for arbitration because you have the uh, mandatory arbitration mm -hmm. clause. I would go a step before that and go in between and send a legal demand letter to Amazon uh, just laying out all your uh, defenses in to arguments the legal department. to the legal department. They could review it, read it, and see if you have a case or not. And maybe it's not worthwhile for them to go through arbitration. But the, the key that everybody needs to remember, both sides, Amazon and sellers need to remember, that arbitrators, at the end of the day, they're human beings. And if Amazon succeeds to convince them that the seller is such a bad player and such a bad person, that even though the uh, contract and the authority shouldn't serve as penalty, the arbitrator might forget that and rule against the seller. And the contrary could also happen. Amazon uh, would fail and the outrageousness of the monopoly and abuse and the authority that Amazon is uh, exercising against the poor little seller, the arbitrator can really give it to Amazon. Are most cases successful? Uh, or does Amazon win most of them? What do you think? I think Amazon wins most of them. Amazon has a very good, I would say a battalion of attorneys that uh, can easily convince the arbitrator of how innocent and how loyal they are to the client base and really cover up their interests of this is basically Amazon taking money mm -hmm. from sellers and just holding it they enjoy the interest. There is even an arbitrator that went so far as to call what Amazon is doing a bottom end of unbashed money grab. Oh, wow. And they also said uh, that it uh, shocks his conscience. He even says that the money that Amazon is holding does not belong to it. It belongs to the seller. And he refuses to shift that and give money to Amazon just because Amazon found the seller to be a bad player. He doubts how diligent Amazon's investigation was or how motivated Amazon is to actually conduct this, this investigation. I mean, think about it. What does it cost Amazon to go to arbitration? They don't even have to get some sort of an accounting to prove damages. Now, liquidated damages is for situations where you can't possibly uh, know in advance what the amount would be. You, you can't foresee it. But when it comes to a single seller that sold, I don't know, 
an item 30 times, even if it was a counterfeit, which usually, in my, in my experience, most of the times it's not counterfeit. It's a matter of uh, imperfect chain of supply that didn't live up to Amazon standards. And if from that minuscule 30 items sold, they can withhold millions of dollars without the need to even, no transparency, no accountability, no need to prove how they got to that amount simply because that seller happened to have a million dollars in the account at the day, on the day that Amazon decides to suspend your account. Mm -hmm. What if they want to suspend it, but they wait a little longer be just after Prime Day or just before Prime Day to, to enlarge the, the uh, uh, cash a little bit more? I mean, it's up to Amazon. And why when would should we take their word for it? When would you say that you have no chances in such arbitration, that you'll lose a hundred percent, that you'll lose? Um, when the money withheld is proportionate. So if Amazon holds 25,000, not a million, and they don't want to give back 25,000, and they accuse you of review manipulation or uh, selling counterfeit products, I wouldn't go to arbitration because part of the shocking of the mind is the disproportion between the amount Amazon, Amazon withholds versus what they accuse you of. Mm -hmm. So if it's proportionate, I wouldn't bother. If they accuse you and that's true, of course. Even if it's false, going through arbitration costs money. And it's not guaranteed that you win. It, it depends on the mood of the arbitrator because remember, he's a human being. So what would be a case that uh, you think uh, there are no chances that a seller would win, that you would never take to arbitration? First, um, it will have to be associated with some sort of deceptive, fraudulent, or illegal practice. Like it will what? Have to, like like what? selling counterfeit goods. If you sell fake Nike and you can't back it up with uh, invoices, if you forge a manipulated documents, if you put in a false identity, if uh, you did severe review manipulation, something that really mm -hmm. uh, would shock Amazon's core and system and go against uh, their uh, policies uh, in a seller code of conduct manner, and you failed the appeals, and you failed the IPI, the interview, and Amazon is not holding that much money, most likely you don't have a lot of chance mm -hmm. of uh, uh, receiving the money back. Some of the cases we, we see very often are those where they, you know, they come to us, hey, Amazon is withholding my funds. Um, I don't have an invoice to show to Amazon. I have one, but I kind of, you know, changed it a little bit and I think Amazon knows. Are these the type of cases that wouldn't pass? I mean, is it okay for Amazon to withhold funds if you don't have invoices to show? I would say it's a matter of proportion. If you don't have invoices to show, but you sold two products and Amazon is withholding a million dollars, yeah, you got a fighting chance. Because with all due respect to Amazon, that's completely disproportionate to the action or the injury that Amazon could suffer from this one seller selling two items. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's, a, it's a whole question of the circumstances and everything that is involved. It's from the documents that you have to support your argument, from what you actually did, if you're guilty or innocent, and to the proportions. You could be the worst seller in the universe. There is a case on arbit uh, from arbitration that the seller forged their identity. They used their grandmother and they, they gave complete false information. They forged the documents. But the proportion of what Amazon took and confiscated from them versus what they actually sold was so egregious that the, the, the arbitrator said, I don't care if you prove that he's a bad actor. There's no proportion. It's completely disproportionate. And Amazon is using it as a penalty. And therefore, it's not enforceable and they made Amazon give the money back. Mm -hmm. So thanks for that. So to, to summarize the, the, you know, this whole process, um, what would you advise to sellers uh, to avoid a situation where Amazon withholds your funds? The first thing I would advise actually is know about the IPI because that's a tool that Amazon uses and sellers don't take it as serious as they should uh, and come prepared. 
especially if you feel that justice is on your side and that Amazon is just wrong and they didn't accept your appeals for all kinds of ridiculous reasons um, that you just weren't convincing enough to them, um, do your homework, know your account inside and out, know your identity information and be able to provide it to Amazon. Um, and also, you know, Amazon does this trick that I've heard of. They call you at one o'clock in the morning for the IPI. Mm -hmm. Who could possibly be prepared at one o'clock in the morning? I don't care how good you are. I mean, just my hairdo would, would, wouldn't do. Um, so try to coordinate a proper time with Amazon, uh, but put the right emphasis on it. Don't, and how don't, does this interview look like? It's a video interview that Amazon uh, gives you a schedule. They schedule with you. They're supposed to be available. Sometimes they just bail on you and then you have to reschedule and reschedule and then they surprise you at one o'clock in the morning with a call. So and what insist, happens on the interview? They ask you to show your documents. They want to go over your identification. Sometimes they ask you for uh, the chain of supply. Uh, they want to verify your supplier. They're basically looking to see that your story fits and that what you said you can back up. Even if you gave a plan of action and you put specific steps in that plan of action, they will interview you about those, the mm -hmm. steps that you've done and check that you've really done them. Uh, one seller said that they had uh, special training for a staff and then it turned out in the interview that they don't have a staff. They're one person show. So obviously, you lied to Amazon, Amazon caught you in a lie. That's what they're trying to do. Um, because if you fail the IPI, then they justify it. it they justify the withholding of funds permanently. So that's one thing I would do. I would prepare and not take the IPI lightly. Even though when it doesn't come to deceptive practices and all that, Amazon does a lot of uh, video verifications and they're easy to pass. And when you pass, everything is clear and all good. When it comes to some sort of accusation that has a little bit of cell of code of conduct in it, be prepared and don't take it so lightly. And that's one thing. Second thing is get your numbers right. Amazon doesn't do the accounting of their injury, but you can do the accounting of what Amazon can possibly lose by your action should it turn out to be true. Mm -hmm. Okay? And never, never confess to something. It's Amazon's... If Amazon is accusing you, it's Amazon's burden of proof to show that you did it. So meaning just calculate how much, let's say I sold 10 fake Nikes, calculate what would be the damages for Amazon. For 10 these allegedly 10. fake Nikes. Yes. Out of 400 products that you sold that were good and that you have chain of supply. Mm -hmm. Argue your case. Argue the disproportionate reaction. Argue that it's not that you were found guilty that you couldn't prove you're innocent. That's a big difference. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to say was, if you are the one in instigating arbitration, usually as the uh, complainant, the burden of proof is on you to show that Amazon didn't do something right. However, there's a lot of precedent and the burden of proof shifts to the party that ha has all the knowledge. Amazon has everything that they're accusing you of on their screen, in front of them, they have the data. So it's actually their responsibility and the burden of proof is on them to prove that you did what they claim that you did, even though you're the one suing them. Mm -hmm. So um, so prepare for a potential uh, IPI, the, the interview, um, and then uh, if that happens, kind of calculate how much, what would be a proportionate uh, amount uh, for, for Amazon for their damages. Um, and then and then decide if you're going for arbitration or a legal letter. I would go for a legal letter anyway. Start with a legal Start letter. Start with a legal letter, lay out your claims. It could end there. Mm -hmm. And if not, you've got a good basis for your uh, arbitration. arbitration. Mm -hmm. Do the homework with the legal letter first. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. You're welcome. Thanks for the tips. And uh... Biggest tip, be compliant. Do not breach. The seller code of conduct. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. Got any questions, guys? Feel this free is how uh, you can reach us. Uh, we're at your service. Thank you. Thank you.